origin using MRI or behavior um, and EEG, and then you take out the, the, the seizure fo uh, focus, you take out surgically. Now, in some patients, 30% of the patients, you can't do that because you don't know where the seizure originates. The MRI and the EEG doesn't tell you. And then what you do, you implant, electro uh, you implant electrodes into the brain. So you have up to uh, eight or 10 of these macro, macro probes. Here you see one in the hippocampus. This is a human hippocampus. And you can then, these things are monitored. Essentially, it's like intracranial EEG. It's like EEG, except it's inside your cranium. And these, pa these patients are monitored 24-7 for three to five to seven days on the clinic. And you can essentially triangulate and find out where the so a seizure originates. Now, what Itzhak Fried did and his collaborators, he hollowed out this electrode, and then he adds nine wires. These are they're just conventional microelectrodes, just, for example, like, like Earl Miller is, is, is using them here in his monkey, or Matt Wilson is using them in, um, in rats and, and mice. So now we have roughly on the order of 100 microwires in, in, um, in these patients. And then what we can do, we can, uh, so here you see one of these uh, patients. You know, it's a conscious human. You can ask him well, what he's seeing. So here's the turban, and, the, and here's the, the, uh, the uh, pre-amplifier here, and then the wires go to the amplified here and then go into a computer. And then so you can show him different images. So here what we show him images, uh, we ask him what the patient likes, we ask him what movies they like, we ask him what, 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 what movie actors, et cetera, they like, or what, what is it they're interested in. Then we sh so this is something you can't do in a monkey, of course. So it's, it's biased. And then here we show him, uh, so we show him all these images. Um, so the image is present. Oh, it's really, you can't see it very well. So this is three seconds, and here, they're supposed to be, you can barely see them, sort of vertical bars here. That's those two vertical bars markate one second. And we show the image always between those two vertical bars here, here and here, and here and here. So that's why we present this image or the image of the Eiffel Tower of the image of it's an actress called um, Jennifer Aniston. And uh, what you can see here, so this is a neuron in the medial temporal lobe because that's where most of the seizure happens. So that's most of our electrodes where they are. It's a single unit in the, uh, in the parahippocampus left. And what you can see here, so this, this unit, uh, 300 milliseconds after the image is flashed on, the neuron responds here. These are six different trials. These are always six trials to these faces. They all happen to be the same actress, Jennifer Aniston. Jennifer Aniston used to be married to another famous actor called, um, I don't know. And then, and, um, <laughs> And so, so, here the, so here the neuron doesn't respond, although the, uh, she's present, but she's also present. And you can do a lot of psychoanalysis here while this neuron doesn't respond. <laughs> the the uh, patient knew, uh, knew Jennifer Anson personally. And it doesn't respond to any other thing. So here you have another neuron that responds selectively to the, uh, to the Sydney Opera House. You, can, uh, you have another neuron here that responds to another actress called um, uh, Halle Berry. You can see here, so it, 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 these neurons are very invariant. Now, this is a very high, this is not a purely visual area anymore. It's the end point, sort of, if you want, of all the sensory processing. It's, a lot of that information gets sent to hippocampus. And so you have neurons here that respond to Halle Berry, whether it's her photograph or whether she's dressed up in a cat suit or there's a line drawing of her or even the text. So Halle Berry, the neuron also responds very strongly. It doesn't respond to other texts doesn't respond when another woman gets dressed up in a cat, in a cat woman suit. Uh, it responds very selectively to Halle Berry. You can also see here uh, Mother Teresa. I mean, there's very little rhyme and reason to this. It's in a different patient. Or um, Pamela Anderson. Again, the, the text Pamela Anderson. Um, so here we have sessions from, this is roughly 1,000 units. And a small fraction of these neurons have these very selective and invariant responses. Of course, it could be that a very, a very large fraction of neurons respond this way, but we only have typically in session is half an hour before the patient gets bored or gets tired or, you know, the nurse comes. So we don't have a lot of time to, to test for such neurons. So what this test is, what these, if you're going to remember anything about the symposium tomorrow, okay, if you're going to remember anything about the presentation this morning, it's because that information was visual processed by your, let's say, infratemporal, um, infratemporal uh, neurons in IT, and then was sent on to hippocampus. And so that's the neurons we tap into here. So this sort of suggests it's a very sparse, explicit, and variant representation. And we've done other experiments with Gabriel Kreiman with, where, we, where we ask questions that directly pertain to consciousness, like you can, for example, ask the patient, close your eyes and imagine, uh, for example, um, the, 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 the various images I showed the patient. And then a subset of the neurons fires as selective to, the, to either the real image presented on the retina or to the imagined image. 
You can do other experiments where you can again manipulate, just like before I showed you, you can manipulate the relationship between the, having the stimulus present on the retina and actually seeing it. And again, you can see these neurons only respond if the page person is conscious of the input. Yeah, these are very reminiscent of rodent hippocampal play cells. In fact, they may be a sort of generalization to a cognitive domain, right? So these cells, like, like Matt Wilson has them, they, they represent only if the rat, you know, goes to this particular part of the, of, the, of, the, of, of the physical layout. And you can imagine that these neurons are sort of something, same, something similar in a high-level conceptual space. Uh, let's skip this. You can also do decoding. You can also ask in an objective way, you know, forgetting about what this person says, you can just ask the following question. Given the pattern of neurons, let's see, you know, given that I have 12 neurons who fire to these different images in different ways, can I decode them using a, a computational algorithm? Can I infer in an objective way, independent of me as an observer, what, in, what input was present? And I can do that very well. So to finish, where, where, what's sort of the long-term strategy for this sort of um, research to study consciousness and its, uh, particularly its neural correlates? Well, so, so you want to do this, and this is now a, a, a sort of comparatively big activity. You want to study neural correlates in humans using fMRIs. I showed you EEG, MEG, or single units. Um, always paradigms that, always just, that dissociate the percept from the stimulus. So you want to use always these various tricks, and there are lots of them in the toolbox of the psychologist. And you can also do it for other things like smell and, and for, for, for audition. Partly this is very interesting, clinical very relevant, because there are interesting questions you want to ask fetuses, I mean, or newborn, or people who are, um, babies who are born prematurely, to what extent are they conscious? And of course, um, if you have patients, like remember the, the huge debate this year we had about Terry Schiavo, uh, to what extent are, are people in, you know, there are 50,000 people in the US alone who are in PBS state, and a somewhat smaller number of patients who are in minimal conscious state, are there some more objective ways we can, we can tell whether that patient in front of me, who sort of barely has sleep-wake transition, actually has still some sentience, some consciousness left? We'd like to develop some objective uh, tests. But ultimately, what you really need to do, you need to go to animals. Because anything you can do in humans is very limiting for obvious reasons. The tools we have are very crude. The tools we have, by and large, measure bulk activity. They measure hemodynamic activity, or they measure bulk EG activity. And you've got to remember that the smallest voxel in a most advanced human imaging device includes roughly 3 million neurons. And so that's very, very crude. And the, the time signal we measure has a, has a you know, it's, it, it, it depends on blood flow. It's three to five to eight seconds. So it's, it's, it's totally mismatched to the signals we really want to be interested in, which are neuronal signals. And of course, then you want to interfere with the si signal, and you, can only, you can't really do that in humans. So you really need to develop behavioral assays. And, with, uh, them of, uh, and together with David Anderson, uh, we're trying to do this for mice. So you can try to use, so there the strategy is you use paradigms that in humans has been shown where you have some behavior that requires consciousness and you slightly change the behavior and you, uh, for a slightly different task, you don't need consciousness. So you have this contrastive strategy in humans. And then you try to develop a very similar paradigm, let's say in monkeys or in um, or in, uh, for vision or in mice using associative conditioning or in whatever your model system happens to be. So again, and you want to have a battery of these assays so you can determine which species have behaviors that require consciousness. Then, of course, then what's really absolutely essential, and this is true for all of the systems in neuroscience, not just for studying consciousness, you want to deliberately, transiently, reversibly, and delicately interfere with the processes that lead up to, up to and following the, the neural correlates of consciousness in model organisms. So let's say you, you, you take a monkey, you, you train the monkey, like Ed Callow is trying to do, you train the monkey to see yellow and to tell you by doing a, you know, true alternative false choice behavior whether, this, whether he's seeing yellow or not seeing, and then you want to interfere and take out those neurons, let's say, using a specific um, promoter in a specific part of the visual system that ex that's expressed in neurons that we have some reason to believe are involved in blue-yellow uh, perception, and then you know, turn those things on and off in order to, to, to go from correlation, because most of what we do, certainly in cognitive neuroscience, most of what we do is correlation. The, the, we still don't